Good morning. Um, yes, this is going to be really interesting because I never practice with time. I don't think many of us have. <laughs> anyway, so um, reflecting to Nathan, for example, just thinking, I'm coming from a country which is um, with a thousand lakes and a lot of forest. So to sort of change tone into seawater with 0.7% salt instead of three. So we have no seafood, none, except for crawfish or crayfish, but they're freshwater. So I'm on a farm. That's what I'm doing. Now, my question is, what are the fundamentals, and as our ingredient knowledge, I'm referring to us chefs. Because I was thinking, when JP pushed, uh, pushed the idea to me to come and speak, and I said, are you really sure you want me to speak? Because we're humble in Finland, we're the polar bears. It's always cold. And then we're just, ooh, me? Uh, are, you, are you sure? So I just sat down and I was thinking, who do we consider to be the ingredient specialist? Because I work a lot with farmers. Um, and I work evidently with, with cooks and other chefs. And I kept on thinking because within the last five years, and a week that we've been open, we opened in 2010. The restaurant in Helsinki is 24 seats. We have a nine square meter kitchen with everything. So no dishwashers except for us. No um, really front of house because we have no waiters. We're waiting all of the tables ourselves. So when you come for dinner, you meet the sommelier saying hello and then the chef is right there. So the contact is quite imminent. So I, was, I kept on thinking, okay, so if I drive two hours to a farm and I meet the farmer and we're out on the fields and I'm asking, could this be used? What can I do? It, do you have anything in storage that I can make use of so it doesn't just wait for people? And on the, on the drive back, I was thinking, okay, so, so the farmer is specialist in what he or she does. And then we consider ourselves to be the master of the ingredients, right? But who is it really? I'll hop on this side. I'm, I'm constantly thinking because Christina in 2012 came into work practice to my restaurant from the local culinary school. And little did I know that she's never farmed before, but she was out on the farm as much as possible during, during the, the five weeks she was hanging out with us. And all of these reflections sort of made me think, is the, the future ingredient specialist, is it a chef, is it a farmer, or is it a hybrid of these two? And I have a lot of friends who actually farm as well, and I have a lot of friends who don't farm but use farm produce. So it, it just kept me thinking, because during my farming experience, see, we opened 2010, but we started farming 2011 for a very good reason. It's like with a baby, the first year, don't do big things. Just try to manage, which we did. It, it was okay. But yeah, and, and my sommelier, Johan, was the guy who actually put me on this quest of planting seeds and seeing what happens. My, my financiers, um, they have enough land 25 minutes from the restaurant eastward, following the coastline. It's a place called Sipo, with vast forests, but also a um, soccer field-sized potato field, which we got, if we want it. And we said, of course we want it, but we can't take a big piece of it because we're, we're running a restaurant and we're working 16 hours a day. And the first year we took 30 by 30 meters. It was a bit too much and we got super lucky. We got so lucky that we got a little bit 
arrogant for the next year. We went like, oh, but this is so easy, so we'll just plant 50 by 50 meters. And we got nothing. And that's when I hit rock bottom ground going, hmm, okay. So to, to have a farm and to be responsible for farming anything for you gives massive inspiration, yes. I can't, I, I could do 45 minutes of just inspiration from the farm. Easy. I'm a talker, so. But um, the, the pride and humbleness, you know, it's like, I grew this. It's mine. You know, I know this plant from seed. And now these seeds that it produced is what you're having on top of your crispy flatbread, right? It just makes you stand straight going crazy good. And actually, it makes you so honest that you just say, yeah, we planted five bags of carrots, but we got nothing. You just go humble, right? Which is good for our fins. Um, much less waste is, is um, only a pinch of what happened because um, we planted organic seeds on soil with, uh, with horse manure. There's five horses around the garden, so we have enough. But um, I'm going to get into that in a bit more. Less meat and fish used in the restaurant on my menus is what happened because we got so much into the farming side of things going, hey, OK. Um, we started mirroring. And by mirroring, I mean what happens at the farm is available at the restaurant. So we weren't preserving. That wasn't our first thing. It was just to try to bring something from the farm that morning, serving it that night. And, and we started practicing with this. Because it's a 25-minute drive, and still we work a long day, and my team is five of us, so including me. Um, it was quite interesting to, to start thinking, okay, so what do I serve tomorrow? If I'm making a snack today with this fava bean or the fava bean leaf, what happens tomorrow? So you started mirroring, okay, maybe next week we'll have this, and maybe the, you know, just following what happens. Now, versatility um, in context with my farming experience means more to reflect on what's going on with the plant. So, Cooking, my cooking became incredibly versatile, for, for example, when we opened in 2010 and I dropped the use of gelatin, totally. So it just gave me a new concept of trying to manage to make desserts without that normal outlook or in-look. So versatility is using the beet with its leaves, but would you ferment the leaves? Would you pickle them? Would you just fry them on a pan? So we just started testing with one vegetable, how to make it versatile and interesting. Um, and zoom in is your coriander that you plant and it goes into flower and those flowers last for four days before they start making seed. So will you be there zooming into the flowers or will you wait and zoom into the seeds? So, and you need to choose, right? So micro seasons, let's say four days, but it could be a wild herb as well. It could be seven days per year because I come from a country where we have snow, we have a winter that lasts for eight months every year. So preserving comes about, right? You go out to the forest, you pick your pine shoots, uh, you pick your spruce shoots, and especially the spruce shoots just around my house. I live 15 minutes from the restaurant west um, it's seven days per year when they're at their best. So go out and get them, unless you do. See you next year. Now, what really changed? We started putting a lot more thought into what we do and when and why and how it's done, right? And why we serve it right now. So we became cooks that sort of portray what's happening at the farm, cooking with that one vegetable, and explaining why we're serving it like this. I've, I've said this before. This is on the menu now at the restaurant. 
and this is what I became as a, as a chef. I buy organic celeriacs. Celeriac is one of my favorite root vegetable because it's not maybe the first choice of Finns. They would choose potato any time over celeriac. But we make a pasta dish with a sauce with cream and a handmade cheese from two hours north. And everything else on the plate is made with celeriac. So you go out to the farm and pick them by hand with a shovel with your farmer because it's a lot of work. And you want to understand what's going on. So you use the leaves for salt. You cut them and you preserve them in oil and the bitterness goes away in two days. Thus, the bulb itself, you wash it really well. You peel it, you dehydrate the peels and the roots. And thus, the Japanese are really great at this. So they give us Westerners a machine where we can just go katsuramuki, making this long band out of your celeriac. And thus we pickle it in a vinegar that we make with the stems. And you have a dish with celeriac, cream and cheese. No waste. So, what I'm saying is, is unless we understand our ingredients, it's, it's incredibly hard to understand what they can do for you. Instead of you going technique, 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 yes? It's sometimes amazingly uplifting for an ingredient, but the more barely you're with your hands in the soil, I drop technique and I go face first with ingredients. So I'm saying understand the humble vegetable, please. Right. It's, it's key for me. This is my farm. So half of it, because there's two, 100 meters by 50, and another one 100 meters by 50. And it's an ex-potato field, so that means that um, it's interesting to farm there. Anyway, so I've had a dream for three years. This is why I came here, my dream, not what I've said until now. Um, three years I've been talking about this, and now it's time to show it to the world. I call it my thumbprint in investing in a better future. It's called Fill the Gap. It's a project where I want to change the way chefs and farmers are educated. Instead of taking chefs, amazing chefs like these, now and trying to sort of change their focus on what they are already focused on and what they have already chosen to do, I would go to those, I call them white pieces of paper, future chefs. So I have two restaurant schools in Helsinki, in the capital, that are in this project. They've started farming already, so we're going to be re reflecting on both farms. Um, so I'm putting chefs on farms. Big deal, right? It's been done. But I'll put farmers in kitchens, right? Imagine going back to chef school, to culinary school, and you have, let's say, three work practices during your three years or five years of education. Imagine having to put one of those on a farm or being able to choose. Okay, I'll, I'll do this work practice in a kitchen, I'll do this one on a farm, I'll do this one in a kitchen where they forage. So, actually, when you become a chef, you have a lot more than what's handed to you until now. So, but I want to put them educated together. So this means chef schools, or culinary schools and farmer schools unite as well. So we create respect, we create incredible understanding, networking, sharing, and caring. So we're giving help to those um, who are going to have to choose their future path in what they become as a professional, as a professional farmer or a chef. Right? 
Um, and we need support, of course, with the local chefs who already do this, who do this in a micro sort of a environment like I do on my farm. So to just go up to these kids and say, you know what, I do this, I pick that, so you share. And it's amazing, right? So imagine a future chef or farmer with this asset. I can. Thank you.